So Kansas City, urban area, 673 square miles. Uh, and within that area, we have 58 square miles in, in the urban core that have combined sewer systems. This is a major issue for Kansas City and a number of uh, urban areas in the U.S. Uh, here's the headlines from a press release from the Department of Justice in 2010. Kansas City is going to spend 2.5, I think that's up to $3 billion now, to eliminate the sewer overflows. One of the ways they're trying to do this is with green infrastructure, bioswales. Uh, and I'll show some photographs of that effort right going on right now in Kansas City. So USDA has called for uh, urban agroforestry as a major focus in the future because there's so many people living there. If we want to have agroforestry adoption, we have to reach those people. We have to get them excited about what we're excited about, working trees. So I see this intersection for urban agroforestry. With these fields, uh, we can carve out an opportunity in the cities for urban agroforestry. So urban agroforestry, to me, kind of centers around urban food forests. Uh, sometimes they're called uh, forest gardens. In the tropics, they're home gardens. They're a agroforestry pra practice in the tropics. Uh, they provide fuel, food, fuel, fiber, fodder, pharmaceuticals, lots of ecosystem services, and a whole lot of human well-being. So we are, these are, systems are classified as sustainable agricultural systems. Uh, they're, they're a great land uh, use worldwide, so we want to use that in the tropics, in the temperate zone. So in my research, I was trying to figure out, you know, how can we measure the sustainability of woody perennial polyculture? So I came upon a work by Torquebillo, uh, Are Home Gardens Sustainable? So I used some of his indicators for my project, things to measure, things to look at, to figure out whether these systems are actually sustainable. Because uh, we can get a lot of ecosystem services, uh, we can provi provision resources, food and water, we can regulate and control water flow, climate, disease, uh, nutrient cycling and crop pollination services, and there's a big cultural, spiritual aspect to this, especially in the cities. They generate a lot of local services that we can use and that we need, and they're all under pressure right now. So these urban food systems are intentionally designed. They use uh, uh, information that uh, can help with these ecosystem services. The term urban food forest was coined by Clark and Nicholas in, a, in their 2013 paper. Uh, I would say that this is not forest farming because it's intentionally designed woody perennial polycultures and it's an important social economic system in the cities. People get really excited about this. So th this is uh, the components of our new urban agroforestry. I'm going to look at those. Agroecology is one of the basis of uh, agroforestry. It focuses on environmental and human elements in agroecosystems the forms, dynamics, and functions of these elements and the relationships. And the goals of the design are to maximize the, the benefit, beneficial interactions of the species. We want to mimic the structure and functions of natural ecosystems. We want sustainable production of agronomic crops. We want to preserve and restore ecosystem services. We want to be economically viable and we want to create vibrant communities. 
So agroforestry, we all pretty much know what that is. Intensive land-based management practices. They're intentionally managed, multi-level optimization, long-term planning. They're economically viable. You know, and we even have livestock in the city. I don't think people are fattening pigs on apples yet, but I see that happening. You know, agroforestry is a sustainable land use practice, and it uh, can, in the city, can have a large cultural ecosystem service benefit. Urban agri uh, agriculture is a growing field all over the nation. It's about having resilient local food systems. Organic no-till is being uh, taught by K-State Extension in Kansas City for the, or the growers there. You know, we can have distributed production in all our yards. You know, if it hails over at my place, maybe it won't at yours. If I have squash bugs, maybe you don't. We want to use edible landscaping for its low ecological impact. If you look in the city, the biggest agricultural crop there is turf. And that turf is, you know, shedding 50% of the inputs into the Gulf of Mexico, so it's not a sustainable system. In Kansas City and, and other cities, we're working on food policy councils and coalitions. There's a food hub effort that comes out of that food policy coalition in Kansas City. And I'm going to talk about other hubs. We, we heard about the climate hub. I've got another hub I'm going to talk about. In Kansas City, we're blessed with the Kansas City Food Circle, started in the 80s to get organic growers together with eaters. And they put out a uh, handbook every year that connects those people that have a uh, expo, two or 3,000 people attend in the spring to meet those farmers and sign up for CSAs and buy transplants for their gardens. Uh, we have a mobile market system in Kansas City, Beans and Greens, and there's, you know, this is what it's about right here. Women bring their kids to the farmer's market to get the first sweet potato to feed the baby. And they see the guy who grew it. So they, they, they're confident and they're happy. Local food's a big thing. It's growing annually. Kind of slowed down, it looks like. 43% of uh, US organic foods are produce. And here we see the Pike Farmer's Market. This is probably the place that the farmer market uh, growth started when people were trying to tear that place down and the people in Seattle rallied around it and kept it. And the farmer's market are growing all over the country. So there's benefits to neighbors and neighborhoods for these practices. Robert Hart, who uh, was one of the pioneers of forest gardening in Britain. He thinks of the forest garden as a spiritual place. And the gardening's decreased street, street crime, makes healthy food available when it's not, and it can help turn around a neighborhood. Now we'll get to permaculture design. It was a, a system uh, devised by Bill Molson. He was a ecologist teacher in uh, Australia and he saw what was going on there and so he came up with this system of a conscious design uh, that looks at ecosystems and how we can mimic those and to harmonize and integrate the landscape with people and the way they live. One of the things I like about permaculture it has ethics and uh, it has a value system that we can, you know, we can look at. Care of the earth, care of people, fair share, you know, share the harvest, get a, get a yield. Some of the other agroforestry systems we're looking at, uh, urban forestry, there's, uh, Urban law, Lumber Company in Kansas City, they're cutting down trees in the neighborhoods, replacing them, and cutting it up for lumber. 
there's a catalpa tree getting ready to go out to the urban lumber company. Lawrence, Kansas has a community orchard that looks a lot to me like a food forest. I see a uh, Siberian pea shrub there next to some uh, trees, and those are nurse trees, nitrogen fixing trees, uh, commonly included in permaculture designs. Uh, Giving Grove is a nonprofit in Kansas City that's putting in, uh, they call them edible tree gardens in schools, schoolyards, churches, neighborhood, uh, urban. Uh, degraded lots. Uh, here's a garden that uh, they put in the Kansas Bhutanese Community Garden. Uh, sadly, two days later, someone dug up four or five of them and stole them. <laughs> yeah, you know, who would think that would happen? But it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> it happened. So here's some green infrastructure in the Center City Neighborhood Association was the first to put in this bioswale with uh, curb cuts. Uh, I was involved in planning out the species for this project. The lot behind it are two land bank lots that the association now controls and we're going to be putting a food forest on those lots at the end of June, just coming up. Here's the design for that. This is a a design will augment this rain garden. The water will flow across and these bermed beds will capture that water and keep it out of the sewer or the bioswale and let it soak in. The trees won't need as much uh, watering. There's no water on this lot and we have to be brought in. Here's, whoop, sorry. Here's some of the green infrastructure that's coming online because of that uh, EPA suit with the city. Uh, the first ones they put in, they didn't put curb cuts because I think the engineers were afraid of what would happen. <laughs> but they got a little bolder with these on Troost and uh, looks like it's ready to go. Uh, I've been out to Seattle to see the Beacon Food Forest out there. It's on the side of a city park that has an underground reservoir for the water department. So they have to be careful what they do there. Looks like they covered the whole ground with uh, coffee bean bags and mulch. So in Kansas City, we've used uh, degraded urban sites. This is one for the Somali Bantu Foundation Community Garden over at 3rd and New Jersey. It's right next to, next to Juniper Gardens is a housing development it's notorious for crime. Uh, Cultivate Kansas City has an office there. Last year someone got shot right outside the door of the office and put a fright into the people working there. But this lot is next to Jersey Creek. Uh, this is what it looked like before we went, went on there. It cost about $6,000 to put these uh, terraces in there, back slope terraces. Uh, but the lots were donated, so it was a pretty good value, I think. Uh, we put in some native plantings in the riparian zone down at the bottom there by the trees. But a lot more work needs to be done there when we get some money. Uh, Missouri Organic in Kansas City uh, works with the city for brush drop off. They grind it up, make great composts and mulches. They've kept, you know, last year 20,000 tons of waste out of the landfills. And this is great stuff. I use it all the time because it doesn't have any weed seeds in it. You go to the uh, Hardware store and buy a 50 pound bag of soil there, it's full of weed seeds. Don't do that. <laughs> so here's my other hub I'm thinking about, Community Ecological Enterprise Hub. Uh, we uh, worked with some architects in Kansas City to come up with a greenhouse. It's uh, energy efficient. This is the design. Uh, 
ecological enterprises or businesses that uh, have ecological and social goals. And they could be a nonprofit or they may be profit driven. And I'd like to know what rootstock would work best, you know, with fruit trees and perennial polycultures. That's something I want to look at. So we want to look at the sustainability claims for temperate forest, food forest. They're claimed to be overyielding, sustainable food production systems, and low labor inputs over the long run. So I'm doing my research at the Cultivate Kansas City Food Forest. It was established in 2011. I'm investigating the sustainability indicators and getting baselines on a number of metrics. Here's what it looked like on establishment in 2011. Those are uh, infiltration swales there to, to hold water on site. This is what it looks like this year. It was a quite a design process. This is a list of some of the plants there. Daniel Dermitzel, the associate director of K Cultivate Kansas City, designed it, along with some other permaculture enthusiasts in Kansas City. Uh, did concept mapping, used Google SketchUp to look at the shade patterns so we know where to plant things. Here's another view of the food forest. Uh, we're going to get a great peach harvest this year. Aronias are really, really plentiful and uh, productive there. And uh, we already have some economic returns. Uh, since 2012, over $3,000 of sales. And Cultivate Kansas City's certified organic, so they get a premium for these products. Uh, we got our first chestnut last year. Uh, there's lots of permaculture, food forest research going on. This is one of the best sources right here of information, Permaculture Association. Uh, they are coordinating research all over the world on food forest work, forest gardens. So urban ecosystems are, can be more sustainable by using agroforestry practices and permaculture. You know, they can lessen the eco ecological footprint of urban areas and increase ecosystem services. They're a valuable ecocultural system that get people excited about their food in their neighborhood, growing things that are beautiful. They want to be in these sites. Some people call them paradise gardens. We need more research and we no need more urban agroforesters on the ground at the Ecological Enterprise Center. Thank you. Can we have time for a couple questions? Yeah. yeah. I have a couple of questions. Like, uh, when you use the landfill stuff for mulching and uh, as a compost, uh, how do you test, like, whether it doesn't have any um, heavy metals or substances like that that's going to be used in the food? Yeah. The question is, I think, uh, are we confident that the mulches uh, are safe to use for food production. And Missouri Organic tests all of their products. And I had uh, K-State Extension test uh, one of their products. They said it was perfect for vegetable gardens. We have a number of community gardens in our city. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, uh, they're all right. I'm, I'm curious about the, um, this land bank idea. Um, the community gardens that we have in place are, are temporary, and so, you know, not, not super conducive to, to perennials. So <laughs> who, who was involved in this, the land bank process? Well, the land bank process is really about when someone can't pay their taxes, mm -hmm. their home, their property is put up for auction. There's so many of these happening, no one's buying them, so the county takes them over. And they, they're just stacking up, stacking up. Any good ones go, the rest covered with uh, what we call weed trees sit there. So there's an effort now on both sides of the state line to get these back into the hands of somebody doing something good. So, and they see uh, there was a neighborhood that uh, 
had a bunch of people move and started doing urban agriculture, the crime went down 21%. So they see the value of these uh, lands going back into, into use. And so we just had a conference last week in Kansas City about how to get more of this land in the hands of people. So those two lots, $500 for both lots. You can get a lot free if you're a nonprofit. Uh, you can get a lot if you do some improvements on it, and that goes against the cost. So they're trying to get, get these back out. Yeah. Was it the County Board of Supervisors? That well, in Kansas City, the school district had something to do with that, the county and the city. So that kind of made it uh, cumbersome. Now it's just one land bank authority. One more quick question. I have one. Oh, yeah. sorry, somebody asked me. Are you sure? OK. You I'm had it. Mine's, you. mine's short. Um, of the people you're working with, what language resonates the most with them? Because I saw that Venn diagram, you had urban forestry, urban agriculture, permaculture, and agroforestry. What kind of language are you using with those folks and what, what kind of resonates most with them? Permaculture. Okay, cool. Permaculture is a popular, you know, idea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you say agroforestry, they don't really know what you're talking about. Yeah. Permaculture has name recognition and uh, you know, we have to ch check the science on it. That's our job. That's mm -hmm. great research opportunities there for us. Great. That's what I'm doing. That's why I came to school, so I could do this. Let's thanks, Stephen, again. And if you have any more questions, you can ask him um, at the break. Thank you.